Imagine with me for a moment that you lived during Old Testament times, uh, back in the day before, uh, before Jesus came, where just people were following after God as, uh, as followers of Israel, living there in, the, in all the rituals and all the laws and all that God had revealed to them during that time. And on one particular Shabbat, let's, which is Saturday, one particular Shabbat, you see him. He's a man, let's call him Benjamin, and he's bringing a couple pigeons to the temple to sacrifice. He's poor, so he's bringing pigeons. They're they're among all the sheep and the goats. Pigeons were also allowed if, if you were poor, so he brings pigeons to the priests, and they sacrifice the pigeons in the prescribed way, blood on the altar, smoke rising up to heaven. The priest declares that his sins are forgiven, that all the atonement has been taken care of in, in the sacrifice and the offering. The meat is then shared between the priest and Benjamin. They eat it together. I wonder how pigeon tastes. Anyway, no, no matter what, for, for Benjamin, this experience means so much. It represents to him his commitment to God, his duty to to the God of Israel, his ancestors, and now to him and his family, his remorse over intentional sin as well as unintentional sin that that he wasn't aware of but that he knew he had offended his God, his longing to be close to God, his duty to the God of the Bible to to do what he has prescribed. It, It maybe takes an hour. And he leaves feeling right with God, all good, at least for another week. One hour in a week. And then he will do it all over again, 167 hours later. Today we begin a brand new series, 167. If you do the math, there are 168 hours in your week. If you spend, you know, somewhere around an hour each week in church, how are we supposed to look at the other 167? I mean, we come to church, we grab a seat, we grapple with the Bible, we sing to God, we lift our hands, we pray, and we turn our hearts to God for an hour. And in 60-some minutes, something important happens, something meaningful, something spiritual goes on in our lives and our hearts, something, something very profound We interact with God, we align our lives, we remember what's important, we we focus on forever. And then we leave and we do it again 167 hours later. But here's what I've noticed. So much of those 167 hours can extinguish that one hour at church. I mean, here's your week. I've I've grafted it out for you each week box represents an hour of your week. And then there's church right there. So here's what I'm wondering. Is there any way to bring any of that one hour of worship into the other 167? Not just one and done, but to treat that hour in church um, and the rest of the time, every other hour, the same way as worship as well. Is it possible to worship God every hour of the week? This past week, uh, I I don't know, maybe I spent a little less than an hour driving to a taco shop, ordering a couple tacos, driving back to church, and eating them in front of my computer. Is anything about that worship? By the way, here's my receipt. Um... As I, was waiting, as I was waiting for my tacos, I'm pondering this new series, kind of thinking about it, and then I noticed the, my order number was 168. <laughs> and it struck me, that hour grabbing and eating tacos was one of the 168 hours in my week. Could that also be worship? Have you ever watched a movie... Uh, and it was like a total waste, and you say, oh, I'll, never, I'll never get those two hours back. How much more tragic to feel like we waste 167 hours in a week? 
Is there a way to redeem those hours? Is there a way to redeem the time? Is there a way to make every hour of the week feel as meaningful as the one week, the one hour that we, we, we spend here together? These are the questions that we will be asking in this series, and we will be turning to a fantastic chapter in the Bible to do so. The, the, the chapter is Romans chapter 12. It's a, it's a beloved chapter of the Bible. So open with me there, Romans chapter 12. It's right in the middle of your New Testament. Uh, we will be in this, this, this chapter for the entire series. It is a great one for you to just really meditate on and kind of saturate yourself with over the next couple months or so. Romans 12.1 begins this way. Therefore, let's pause there. <laughs> what? After one word? <laughs> yeah, let's pause there. Because I was taught early on when I study the Bible, when I come across the word therefore, I should ask, what's it there for? In other words, what came right before it? What is it building on? So right, right away, I read the word therefore, and I want to say, what is it linked to? Well, in a way, Paul, who wrote this book of the Bible, is referring to everything that he has said in the first 11 chapters of Romans. Uh, this chapter in the book of Romans is a major turning point in the book, building on everything that Paul has already put forth. But for our purposes today, all we have to do is go back one verse. Turn with me to the last verse of chapter 11. And even by itself, just looking at that verse alone, it sets up our passage so much. Romans 11.36 says this, For from him, God, and through him, and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. In a way, it is one of the boldest verses in the entire Bible. Because in it we discover a radical way to view your week. I mean, consider what it's saying. At least three things. First of all, it's saying that all things come from God. See that? All things are from Him. Way more than just the one hour at church, way more than a few select hours during the week, everything that fills your 167 is from Him. For example, the Bible says that family is a gift from God. The Bible says that, that your friends are a gift from God. Opportunities are a gift from God. The world around us, the nature of creation that he's given us, a gift from God. Work itself is a gift from God. Money, a gift from on high, according to the Bible. The Bible even says that sleep is a gift from God, which, you know, is about, well, about this many hours in your week is spent sleeping. So someone says, well, let's take those hours off the chart. You're not doing anything spiritual when you sleep. But the Bible says the Lord grants sleep to those he loves. Even sleep, then, we are supposed to see as a gift from God, something that he gives to us. In other words, everything that fills your 167 is from God. But this radical way to look at our week says, says much more than that. It also says all things are through him. That is, everything you do from Sunday morning to Sunday morning should be done through God. We kind of have this odd idea that, that we are, you know, only really engaged with God at church, really connected with him, re really serving him, really really worshiping him when we're together within these walls, and the rest of the week is sort of up to us. I mean, we would probably never say it that way out loud, but we act like it. Maybe we even pray and ask God to guide our week, but then the moment comes where we pull into work, we pull into the coffee shop, the grocery store, the gym, and we're like, I got this. I'm good. We shift into self-drive, automatic pilot. Instead, this passage reminds us that all things, everything that fills that 167 should be done through God. And, and then it, it, it goes even deeper than that. It adds all things are for Him. That is, all things should be done for God. Everything for His purpose, everything for His glory, everything for His, his kingdom and for His benefit. 
Researchers tell us that the, that the average adult spends about two to two and a half hours a day eating and or drinking, even though they might be doing something else at the same time. You're drinking coffee, but you're also driving. You're eating popcorn while you're watching the next episode. So this is about how much of your week is spent eating and or drinking. And again, you know, if someone says, well, let's take those hours off the chart as well, I mean, you got to eat. But here's what's interesting. The Bible says this. It says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. So this passage reminds us that all things, everything that fills our 167, even those things that we consider rather ordinary or routine, those things should be done for God as well. So do you see why I'm saying it's sort of a very radical way to look at our lives, and it's captured my attention as we've thought about this, is what I'm calling the from, through, for principle. And it's in the middle of your outline. I've had a couple of weeks to, to ruminate about this message, and I really think it could transform the way you think about every week of your life. The from, through, for principle. In fact, let's, let's make a chart with three parts of the principle, uh, this principle on the side. All things are from God, all things are through God, and all things are for God. And then let me kind of flesh this out with three different scenarios. And I want to think about each of these scenarios because I want us to really get the idea of what it would mean to apply this principle to our lives. First, let's consider how to apply this principle to the positives in your life. This by the way, is the easiest. With anything positive in life, since it is from God, well, we thank Him because He he gave it to us. He gave it to you. He gave you your kids, your, your health, your opportunities. He gave you that sunset that you admire as a gift from Him. He gave the rain that we appreciate. Your dog licking your hand when you get home. That's a gift from Him. Also, with with positives in our life, since they are meant to be done through God, then it's not that we just appreciate them and thank God for them. We are meant to use them, those things, and appreciate those things wisely, asking God to help us use it in a way as He equips you. He equips you. He, he, he asks God to help you love your kids well. Ask God to help you, assist you to do your job wisely, this gift from him, to lead you in your financial decisions with the resources that he's entrusted. And then finally, with the positives in life, since they are meant to be done for God, aim for his glory because he has a purpose in it. Remember that, that God gave you those good gifts for a reason. Uh, to seek and honor Him and His goal in them. Uh, remember that God is, has, has a plan for the things that He entrusts you with. So don't just, just enjoy them. See them as these, this a stewardship in your life, a responsibility that you've been given um, to utilize it for His purpose. Now, positives are probably the easiest way to apply the, the from, through, for principle, but also the easiest to overlook because we can just kind of take it for granted, these positives around us. It gets a little trickier with challenges. How is the from, through, for principle applied to the challenges that we face? Well, with challenges in your life, we also learn to see them under this banner that all things are from God. So we trust Him because He uses it. When stress comes into our lives, He can use it to draw us closer. He can use sickness to build compassion. He can use criticism to build character. Every challenge that that you face is filtered through the loving hands of God who who is able to turn it and use it for His glory and for His purpose. With challenges then, we we see them as from God in the sense that He will use them. Also with challenges in your life, because we believe that all things are meant to be approached through God, well, we look for God to strengthen us. Look for God to strengthen you, 
to give you what you need to approach that challenge. There, there's this, this sense that as believers, whatever we face, God is also giving us the resources to, to face it. And we have these challenges that come into our life, but he, he equips us along the way and strengthens us along the way uh, to approach it. Finally, with challenges in our life, because we believe that all things are meant to be done for God, aim for God to be glorified in that challenge, knowing that he will redeem it. He will redeem it. There's a great passage in uh, another place in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 4.17, 4, says this, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, you might, you might say this doesn't feel like a light and momentary trouble. It feels like a big challenge. But God says in comparison to what he's doing, that is much heavier. The work that he's doing in your life, much more weighty the way he's going to redeem it in us. So, so we lean into the fact that even in challenges, that God, it can be done for God because he is redeeming it. Turns out challenges, God also wants to supply this from, through, for principle. But probably the, the hardest to apply is tragedies. How are these from God? I mean, God is not the author of evil or confusion. He is not part of, of sin or divisiveness. With tragedies in your life, believers for centuries have understood them as from God in that He is sovereign over all things, and therefore He allows it. He allows it. It is not that God is cruel, God is good to the core. It is just that in his economy, he allows for human and global sin and suffering as a part of our freedom. He allows it. Which maybe sounds harsh, but, you know, sometimes for me, it has been this very truth that has gotten me through. I remind myself, this is not just the sinfulness of another person, though that may be part of it. This is not just the brokenness of living in a falling, fallen world, though that may be true. God allows these kinds of things in our broken world, and he is able to bring good even through them. If the worst tragedy that this world has ever seen, the crucifixion of God's perfect holy son, became the greatest blessing in our lives, our salvation, then God can work in our tragedies as well. Also, with tragedies in your life, since God wants us to approach them through God, look for his involvement as he carries you. He carries us through these tragedies. Sometimes we know we, we couldn't do it on our own, but it is God who is there to, to carry us through. His strong arms embracing us and His gentle care leading us. Finally, with tragedies in your life, since all things were meant to be done for God, remember that He will restore it. In this life or the next, He will restore it. I love the story. Uh, one day, Peter was talking to Jesus, and, you know, Peter just learning as he goes, trying to make sense of this new worldview that Jesus was bringing into his life. One day, Peter was struggling with, with how to understand why it was so hard from his perspective to follow Jesus. And Jesus told him this. Jesus said this, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man, talking about himself, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, everyone who has you know, in a long way, basically left or lost family members, property, etc. For my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will in, will inherit eternal life. In other words, in the future, whether this life or the next, Jesus will restore it when we put it in the category of for His sake. 
So there we have you know, three di very different scenarios of how we can apply the from, through, for principle. Everything in our lives is given by Him, used by Him, filtered through His loving care. Everything we face, God is ready to equip us, strengthen us, and carry us through. And every hour of our week is meant to be used for His purpose. Even the negatives, He's at work to redeem and restore them. Positives, challenges, even tragedies. And so you, you see what I'm saying. It is really like a revolutionary way to look at our lives when you, when you realize that all things can be put in this category. And all of that is behind the very first word of Romans 12, 1, the word, therefore. If this is true, therefore. And now we're ready for the rest of the verse. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... We're about to get our response to this view of life, our response to the, the from, through, for principle, our response to this radical view of our week. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. What is our response to this incredible mercy of God? His, his involvement in every hour of our lives, His ability to redeem all that we do, all that we face, to, to transform it and to see it as from Him, through Him, and for Him? Be living sacrifices. To offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Now, a lot of times when I hear sermons on this, uh, there's a lot of emphasis put on the, the term living, the living part of living sacrifices. I mean, it is, to be fair, a striking way to put it. Living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. I mean, sacrifices back then in the temple were, by definition, holy and pleasing. That much is sure, but they don't, they don't make it into the temple unless they're a perfect specimen, unblemished, therefore pleasing to God, holy to Him. But living? Mm -mm. They were slain in the process. They came to the temple and that was it. One hour. Nothing further. But God is calling us, you and me, to something way more radical. We come to him as sacrifices, that is, in a way that is holy and pleasing, but fully alive. And we come for, for one hour a week, and then we keep doing it for 167 more. In fact, here's what's amazing and often overlooked. The word living has, has several nuances to it. First of all, it implies living in that when we talk about like our way of living our way of life. Living could mean our way of life. That's why one translation of the Bible, a message translates it this way. This is a great translation. It says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. To be a living sacrifice, then, implies to be a sacrifice in every part of our life. In other words, God wants all of this as an offering. God wants all of this to be a from, through, for Him experience. As we are living sacrifices all through the week. And it's even better than that. The word living here, often in the New Testament, is the very word that is used for the idea of resurrection life. Resurrection life. In other words, all week long, we're meant to experience the risen life of Jesus permeating through us. That he, that he is there to guide us, to empower us, to strengthen us, to, to infuse us with, with his ability to direct us and to redirect us, to energize us. We, we face things and goes, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. And he says, you'll do it in my strength because I'm there to do it through you. 
resurrection life then is a living sacrifice, is, is, is a sacrifice that is living now um, in light of the death and resurrection of Jesus. As we've died to our, our old behaviors and we are alive to what he wants us to do and, and how he wants us to live as he lives through us. But the word sacrifice is also quite expressive. Look again at the middle of, of this verse. Offer your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So according to this passage, to be a sacrifice means, first of all, to be holy, which basically means to be set apart for God. Holy is set apart for a, for a purpose. Back then, sheep were raised to be sacrificed at the temple. And they were set apart specifically for that end, uh, in, inspected and ensured to be pure and unblemished and, and always raised for this very purpose. So too, our lives have been set apart for God. When we have trusted Jesus as our Savior, we become set apart for His purpose and we're meant to be an offering all our lives living for that purpose. Not just once, but ongoing sacrifice. And then these sacrifices are described as pleasing. And according to the Bible, we, we please the Lord primarily one way, by faith, when we trust Him. The book of Hebrews says something kind of amazing. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. When we trust Him, it pleases Him. So also, to be a sacrifice means trusting God. To live each hour trusting God to guide us through. Last month, I was helping with this refugee project, and someone said to me, uh, thank you for sacrificing your time. And, and it strikes me, that's what we are always supposed to do. Sacrifice our time. Not in the neg negative sense of like, oh, what a sacrifice, you know, not that way, but in the positive sense of how great it is that every hour of my week can be lived by faith, pleasing to God as a living sacrifice. Sacrifice our time, all 168 hours, the one hour is Sunday and the other 167 as living sacrifices. That's why I love how this verse concludes. It finishes this way, this is your true and proper worship. When we do this, all of life, every hour of your week, even the parts outside of church, become worship, true, proper worship. It's amazing. Back in the Old Testament days, Offerings were limited to the temple. One quick hour, it was over. With the coming of Jesus, there was this radical shift. We become the sacrifices. We are those who are called to be living sacrifices, living for him every hour of the week. All things from him, all things through him, and all things for him. And for me, that's quite revolutionary. It means that, that all of life becomes sacramental. All of life becomes spiritual. Everything we do, even the ordinary things, become meaningful and meaning-filled. Because every hour can be an offering to God. It turns out we come together and we sit under God's Word and we sing some songs and we fellowship with one another and one hour a week infuses every hour of the week because everything becomes worship. Father God, it is quite radical when we think about it, what you've called us to and how, how things change so dramatically with the coming of your Son. And I pray that we would uh, really... Uh, 
learn more and more what it means to be your living sacrifices, to live for you in a way that all life, even the ordinary parts, become sacramental and spiritual for you. Every hour can, we can live as an offering to you. Thank you that we have, we have this time together. We don't, um, uh, we don't take for granted this hour. And we pray, Lord, that you would take this time that we've had and continue to have and help, help it to pour into every part of our week ahead. And we trust you for that. We also thank you for the good gifts that you have blessed us with, the resources that we have. And as we share those for the work of your ministry here, I pray your blessing on the gifts and the givers. May we know um, the transformation that comes in us and around us as we participate in, uh, in giving towards your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.